For the first part of our Western Armenia series, we introduce to you today Anio Vanisian, director, producer, and filmmaker who spent seven years making the film The Hidden Map. The film documents the journey of Ani, a granddaughter of genocide survivors, alongside Scottish explorer Stephen Sim, who travel across Western Armenia discovering the hidden past of the Armenians who used to live there. The film will be shown over a thousand times all across the country on your local PBS stations and affiliates in the month of June 2022. Make sure to check out the links shared on our social media to learn more about how you can see the film. You are listening to Haituk Talks, the official podcast of the AYF West. I'm Haig Minasyan. I'm Talia Bezjan. And we're just a couple of Armenians talking in the world. A couple of Armenians talking in the world. Ani, welcome to the show. I'm really excited to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here with uh, these two bright, young <laughs> lights. You really are great stars. Me? Yes. <laughs> no, no, no. You and Talia. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, but no, thank you for being here. We're excited. And uh, I've been meaning to see this uh, movie. Uh, I wasn't able to see it this past month. Um, and I think it's, I believe it's been out for a year, correct? It has been. It uh, came out first on NBC LX, which is a young NBC network. Nice. Last year it came out uh, on April 24th when President Biden recognized the genocide and made that announcement. It was on the airwaves across the country. At the same exact moment kind At of that thing. Moment. How symbolic. Yeah. You made the pilgrimage, the holy pilgrimage to Western Armenia, historical Armenia, uh, which I'm very jealous about. I'd, I'd love to get to go one day. No, so, um, and I'm also, so I'm a big map nerd, and I see the name Hidden Map, and it makes me very happy and excited to see the show, but it makes me think, um, it makes me, like, when I think of map, the Hidden Map, I mean, I kind of get an idea that it might be sort of metaphorical, however, I wanted to ask, you know, since it is a map, uh, what were you searching for through this journey in Western Armenia? Um, it is metaphorical, Okay. though there are many, many Armenian maps over thousands of years mm -hmm. that have been wiped out by Turkey mm -hmm. and replaced by their new artificial borders. Yep. So as metaphorical as it is, and as poorly as I do with maps, unlike yeah. you, <laughs> it's very meaningful because the hidden map is everything that lies beneath the surface I see. of today's map of Turkey. Yeah. All the stories, all the voices, all the relics, all the truths, everything that's been waiting more than a century to yeah. be discovered and told. And it's still there. It's 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 uh, hard to find, but um I as much as they tried to destroy it so many times or try to hide it, they hide it off the map, it seems like you just walk around and you can find it, you know, just on the right next to you somewhere. It, you know, it's not that hard to find. The relic or the, the person. It is hard to find because people don't look for it. Mm. But if you do look for it, and if you're among the fortunate to go and touch those lands and see those lands and be a part of who we are and where we came from, where we come from, you realize that it's there as much as they try to destroy everything and erase evidence of everything Armenian, mm -hmm. it's still there. So Okay, so I think I get it. The This hidden map, basically, you can't look at a regular map, right, if you're looking for these Armenian things. You have to look at the hidden map, the one that's not there. So to find, uh, you know, the Armenian history in uh, in Western Armenia, um, you got to go off the beaten path. You can't, uh, uh, you got to look where no one else is looking and maybe be in the moment and look around you. So uh, I like the name a lot. That's all I was trying to say. Thank you very much. <laughs> I like the name a lot. And by the way, uh, even if you do look at their map today, they've changed the names of thousands of villages. Everything. Some of the major cities still have similar names or some of them have the same names, but almost everything has been changed because they're just trying to get rid of it's any yes it's just a, a, a different a, a different branch of the genocide a different way of continuing the genocide mm -hmm. and uh, and 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 so it goes and it still continues but 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 when you're in those lands 
and you talk to people, people who aren't supposed to talk about the genocide and about the past, they remember the Armenians. They know. They remember the old names. And some of them have the courage and the conscience to say so, especially the older people and some of the very brave young people who just can't live with the lies anymore. Yeah. So no GPS, but to get around, you can ask the old people yeah. and they'll know where to go. I just want to say I love where we're sitting right now. Did you go to school at Verahian? No, no, I went to Palisades High School and Paul Revere Junior High School. And all my schools were around Sunset Boulevard. I went to American schools all my life, yeah. but have grown up here at Fedayan. I came to church here when I wasn't in Fresno. I came to Sunday school here. I came to AYF meetings here for many, many years. And now for many years, I've come here because my children, Sophie and Daron, spent their entire lives at yeah. Fedayan. Yeah. So to see two young, vibrant, smart people sitting in this AYF room full of high tug journals and frames and and um, the good stuff yeah and trophies from athletics and and just and people pictures of people it, it's a continuation and and i know your parents mm -hmm. and we grew up together whether on the east coast or west coast and and you know my kids yeah. <laughs> so it's a continuation and and it is so wonderful and so encouraging and so filling to know that it carries on, that you carry on. And so it's familiar grounds, familiar people, familiar um, vision and heart and soul and purpose and understanding that we have to carry on. So I love sitting here with you and your three microphones. No, it's, I mean, it's a, it's, I, it's like a, transgenerational intergenerational thing where like uh i don't know it definitely came from my mom and my parents right just like probably talia's parents you know it's uh, you guys who kind of you know help share that will to continue the cause and all the work and everything and so it comes naturally and i enjoy it i mean i'm from orange county it definitely and I, comes naturally i i, I drove you know i'm from orange county and what we're at fed i right now that's an hour 45 during rush hour you know but i Thank don't you. but no i don't think twice about it i don't even complain i don't care I, i'm happy to do it um this is the least that i can do and i mean uh with everything going on in armenia and our history i mean i used to think about western armenia the way i think about artsakh today right you know like oh, we you know oh everything's lost what are we going to do so uh pessimistic and uh, nihilistic and now we have an ex you know now we have artsakh that's on, on our minds as well um so i mean i want maybe i can ask you that is uh you know with what's going on right now um you know uh, what you know how how is this relevant how is learning about western armenia maybe relevant to um the importance of artsakh <laughs> Artsakh to me is it's a continuation of what happened to us over a hundred years ago, which by the way, a hundred years or a hundred and six years or seven years may seem like a very long time, but it's just a moment in time. And um so they didn't finish what they started then and they got away with it. And today they're getting away with it i mean i can see them like you know getting rid of all the monuments changing all the names all that stuff's going to happen again which is why it's so important that the artsakh stays independent and not within azerbaijan but and why it's so important for all of us to engage in any way that we can yeah. whether that means today i saw a video of a, a singer who was in artsakh saying you know it's yeah. the people who are here with their feet on the ground who are keeping it alive and we have to support them. to support and do whatever we can i was in artsakh in november of 2020 uh, right after the war right when they had said we're giving it all you have three days to get out basically i was there the last few days yeah and uh i was kind of reliving well i wasn't living it because i don't live there but i felt it i mean i don't pretend or i don't say that i i don't i don't have I'm, the the 
actual trauma that the people living there do, but I do have that trauma. I know what you mean, yeah, because it's in our blood. You know, we've relived it in our heads so many times with our own history. And and I saw the place vacated. I saw mm. villages burnt. I saw these beautiful Armenian churches and monasteries, and I thought to myself, they're going to do to these the same that they did to mm-hmm. those those immaculate creations in historic Armenia. And we have to do everything we can to document what there is and and let the world know and to keep it alive. I mean I mean I don't know how we can give up on it. Give up on it, nor do nor do I know how we can save it. Uh, it. It's yeah. But I do know that if there is a hope of saving it, it it's by being involved, by caring, by not saying I'm done. Yeah. I'm done. I've given what I can. I have my own life to live and they messed up and they messed up so much that I'm not going to worry about this anymore because look at what we look what look what our forebears have been through to get us this far, to create this for us and to just kind of have that uh i know you don't want, i don't want to say connection. give up but but like uh to stop that effort i mean for i mean i i do that all the time by the way i always compare what we're going through now as to what it was like 100 years ago and i'm sure they felt even more depressed about the situation where 90 percent of the homeland was lost you know not just artsakh i mean the odds were way more stacked against them and they pulled through and you know we're gonna be we gotta be strong and you know not let the this last defeat defeat us entirely you know the it ain't over till it's over um i believe that yeah and i mean uh, if i the way i also think about it is you know if i had a chance to save a part of western armenia today or if we had some of it now you know i would try my you know it, it, how amazing would it be to have a piece of that still you know intact uh, the way artsakh is considering you know um so okay that opportunity 100 years ago we weren't there for that they tried their best uh, well, this is like the one piece of our homeland that, you know, we have still. Uh, and, you know, win we're or gonna lose, we're, we're, we're going to try to end. You know, we're not going to give up. But. I feel like talking about it just like this, too, or just like keeping up with the storytelling and all just keeps it alive yeah. for most people. Yeah. Especially if like you haven't had the chance to visit. Because when I visited there, I remember just being there. You felt such a strong connection to those people just like you said like you felt like you could feel the trauma even though you haven't gone through it so i think it's important to just share those experiences as well like absolutely you're doing with the film absolutely and uh when our kids went you went with pili Bos, my yeah. kids went with Fedayan, and sophie my daughter went and said that going to armenia where she had been before we had been before but she went with her class and then to artsakh mm-hmm. Uh, was the most um, impactful imp- experience. Yeah, like, I wish no we visited Artsakh longer than we were in Yerevan, actually, because it just felt so much like more real. I know. And, and that's very important because with Western Armenia, um, we hear about, I heard about it all my life, but you hear about Kharpert and Erzurum and Van and Dikranagerd and Mush and so forth. Uh, I don't know if your generation does. I mean, m- maybe your generation, when you ask where are you from, you might say, oh, my grandparents were born in Beirut or in Halib or, or wherever it is. Maybe it's even already a step even farther removed. Mm-hmm. But even for me, hearing those stories, it was so real. I mean, I grew up hearing the stories of my grandparents and of many others uh, because my father is a professor yeah. of Armenian history at UCLA and and at UCLA, his name is Richard Havanesian, and he the start, Godfather. Yeah, he started he this um, Armenian oral history project where he taught his students, his college students, how to interview and get the stories of survivors. And this was in the seventies and the eighties, and that wasn't being done very much. J. Michael Hagopian, mm-hmm. a filmmaker, had done some video interviews or film interviews which were more targeted, but my father wanted to capture these stories before they were gone. And many of these people had never told the story. So I kind of grew up with 
my grandparents' stories, sitting on their porch in Fresno, California, 3312 Low Avenue, a, a little two-bedroom home, mm-hmm. and the whole street was survivors who had started anew in this Armenian neighborhood of Fresno, which was very similar to the land that they came from because Fresno was vineyards and farmland yeah, and so forth. Yeah. I never even thought to like talk to my grandparents about how their parents were gen- genocide survivors, but um, going to an Armenian school, you know, most of our Armenian projects would be to interview our grandparents, mm-hmm. see like where our ancestors were from and learn more about it. So I feel like it's a very like engaging topic for people to ask their grandparents about. So important. It's so important for your grandparents and for your parents. Talk to your parents. Pick up your phone, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, whatever it is, <laughs> and just talk to them. Yeah. I still learn things from my parents, or my, my mother is now um, not here, but to this day, my, my father, but she's with us. Hundred yes, percent. In fact, mm-hmm. she sat next to me every day, and she said, "As as 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 bad mutiyana betge kitna betge nes and nes nes." But you will learn new things every day, and it will become more and more and more real. And so, what I was going to say is that for Artsakh, uh, you have the good fortune of having touched it and felt mm-hmm. it, and and talked to the people in the land, and you know it's real, and. So with historic Armenia, with Western Armenia, it almost becomes a figment of your imagination mm-hmm. because you've heard so much about it, but so it goes never experienced it. it goes farther and not farther, but it goes deep into your consciousness, but in a an intangible way, like a like a fantasy almost. But you know it's real. So when you go there and you touch that land, when you Go to Kharpert and to the villages of Kesrik and Bazmashen or to Zitol and Erzurum or to Gars or to all these places that you know about. They're real. They're real. I know. They're living. I want to go. And it's like they're shouting out. They're shouting out these stories, these voices that have been silenced beneath the soil, the relics that they try to... Many of those relics are beneath the soil, too. Mm -hmm. But they want to be, they want to have life again. Mm -hmm. And the only way that happens is if we give it to them. So you've uh, obviously traveled to Western Armenia so many times, but can you tell us a little bit about your first time, like your first experience? Yeah. And what you felt, what it felt like visiting those places, discovering more that you didn't really know about? The first time I went, I went with my father, Richard of Anasyan, and Armen Aroyan, who's uh, a man who was a head of everyone's time. He, for many years, has been taking uh, Armenians, small groups of Armenians, of, pil- of, of pilgrims, of uh, people who want to go find Mm -hmm. their past and their homes and their their parents and grandparents ancestral native homes he's been um taking people for a long time and it was the first time i went was in 2011 or 12 with my father and with our men and i was in the airport here Mm -hmm. and some turkish man talked to me here in l.a we were in New York. In New York already, but like at the customs or something, or randomly? At the, at the gate. Oh. oh, wow. And he and was kind of like, you know, well, guys, sometimes. They knew you were Armenian, so, I guess. Uh, no, he didn't know I was Armenian. He just wanted to flirt a little. Oh, uh, I see, I see, classic. Mm. And, and I looked at him, and I said in my mind, go to hell. Yeah. Guess where I'm going. <laughs> and then I went there, and we didn't spend time in Istanbul. I mean... All the times that I've gone have been east because east is where Armenia was. But there were Armenians everywhere. There were Armenians obviously in Bolis. Yeah. 
and many churches still there. I mean, still a community there. Yeah. But even all the way in those cities on the on coast, the, on the coast, like, Greek coast like over there. Bardizag and Izmir, and then you go to Smyrna, Izmir, and you go to what's, uh, what's that uh, town in the south? I forget what it's called. So uh, be, uh, there were so many places. So we actually drove. Oh, wow. And um, I think our first stop was Bardizag, mm. which is, again, it's not an Armenian. It's not part of Armenia, but it was Armenian. And there was an, a church and there was a school. And I remember seeing Armenian writing for the first time. And wow. even though it was very faint. And then in a park, I saw a little Armenian stone with writing that had been carved out from, really? a, from, from a cemetery or something. And they put it in a, in a wall of a park. And I... It was as if I was on a on a hunt mm-hmm. for things Armenian, and it was as if I was like I almost like found myself or ourselves. It was like ah ha, here we are. And that's like the first spot. You're like it was the first spot. first spot you found. You're like wow. this is it. I'm doing it. This is amazing. And then you realize. That as much as they try to get rid of it, they really can't. They can't. Mm-hmm. Maybe I don't know. I mean, they've done a very good job <laughs> of destroying every, uh, as much as they can. But there's just too much. We but made we made too much. Made so much, and you know, sometimes we lose faith. Sometimes Armenians say and and we could be very critical of our own religion, and maybe we don't know enough about uh, our own religion. But I just have to say that being there. And seeing these magnificent, stoic, majestic, grand ruins on mountaintops, a three-hour walk away from all civilization, and you look at this and you say, oh my God, how did they make this? What did it take to create this a thousand years ago? And through it all, it's still standing. It's, It's a testament to our strength our faith our perseverance our against all odds yeah doing it mm-hmm. and we're st- still there it's like try to destroy me but you can't even earthquakes even god tried to destroy it i'm kidding uh, even the <laughs> yeah, land tried to destroy could've. our stuff and it's still there so yeah. um no that's my hope and that's what i've i mean we can we see pictures of rubble and we see pictures of the ancient ruins and stuff they're there Sometimes they seem like they're decaying a little bit more. Sometimes you see they're actually repairing some stuff. Um, or sometimes you see like a rock in like someone's old house that they put it like, you know, they fit it in there and everything. Um, it That happens everywhere. Yeah. By or, the way, the further east we went, that we started that first trip mm-hmm. on the west and we drove all the way through and we went wow. to Giligia and we went to Musalir where there is one Armenian village remaining in all of Turkey. There is one village that still remains that is all Armenians, and it's called Vakov. It's a small village. Of, near, is it near, uh, like, Kesab, like down there? Yeah, by yeah it's in Musaled. Yeah, Musaled. It's Musaled. It's up Musaled. I've heard of it. And uh, there I met a hundred-year-old man. Oh, my God. And uh, and I spoke with him. And wherever I went, I interviewed people. Not interviewed. I spoke with them, with, and my camera so was share on. share their stories. And thank God I did, mm-hmm. because I have their stories. I have hundreds of stories wow. of people... Armenian, Turk, Kurd, hidden Armenian, all sorts of stories of people who also tell that story of our past. It's not just a dead story. It's just not 107 years ago or, or more. It's still alive. And so... I, I want to hear a story about wh- uh, about someone you met from the village or the town of where your family was from. What town was... What town is the Hovhannisians from, let's say? Um, Eastern. Babi Kaspar Hovhannisian mm-hmm. is from Bazmashen, which is in Kharpert, which is right outside of the main city of Mezre. And there is, in Kharpert has a, you go up a hill and there is upper and lower and there were many churches there. And that's where the Euphrates College was, which was one of the most forward progressive I'm, I'm Harpetsi, by the you way. Are. My mom said, yeah, Italian. Okay. Um, and they're all educated women. Like all the, yeah. all the women in that family were all school teachers and uh, prof- whatever, stuff like that. So it makes sense because of that college. So um, I had heard about Basmashen 
all my life. I had heard about Chaya Peret all my life and also about Zitor Erzurum. I mean, I, I could tell you stories about all these places, but I remember being um, absolutely devastated because I went thinking I'm going to find something. Mm -hmm. And it was completely, completely empty. The village of the your village. ancestors? They had built a newer one nearby. They took the stones, they put it over there, right. whatever. Uh, there was a donkey in what used to be the Basmashen. Mm -hmm. And that donkey became my friend. <laughs> no, really. Yeah, it makes like sense. I, that donkey became my friend. And, and he, that donkey was still there. Yeah. Working hard and holding down the fort or saying, I'm not leaving. I, I don't Habitating know. Habitating there, Hab yeah. eating the food, living on the land. But there was a lady I met nearby and um in in the first house i could find near the emptiness and she said to me in turkish i don't speak turkish but i had someone with me who, who did knew it and she said this was bazmashen it's called sari chubuk but bazmashen which means a place of many homes yeah bazmashen yeah and this is where the church used to be. And this is where the homes used to be. And I said, why haven't you built on it? And she said, because it would be a sin to. Haunted. <laughs> so people in their own ways recognize they it. They know, they understand. And then she showed me a fountain that used to be an Armenian fountain or this place where Armenians used to step on grapes or, or cru not step on, crush their grapes. Yeah. And then she showed me, um, actually, there were moments when I was there with her when there was no one else with me, so I didn't know what she was saying. Mm -hmm. So it was, I then I called and someone came and so forth. But yeah. uh, I keep thinking about what I don't know. I keep thinking about, I know this much, a little, I know a little bit, I feel a lot. It was a huge discovery, but I feel like there's so much more yet to discover mm -hmm. and it matters. It, it matters. And then nearby I found a very old lady a very old lady who said this was all Armenian. Yeah. And she said, you know, Turks have this myth that wherever there are Armenian crosses or things, that, that there is gold. So they also destroy because they think they're going to get rich. Yeah, that's a whole thing. The yeah. treasure hunters, yeah. Yeah, treasure hunters. Yeah. And she goes, she said, gold didn't come out, but these did. Mm -hmm. And so in her front yard, she has pieces of things that came out of a church. So How like... Special. The stories are all there. Yeah. And then in Basmashen, I there was a hole in the ground, and I jumped in that hole. And um, and I had just finished reading a passage from my nephew's book, Guide in Havana yeah. book called Family of Shadows. And I had read a passage. I just had the book with me, and I read about how the village women were allowed to go drink at the village fountain one last time from their red jugs before being led into exile, which is where my grandfather was separated from his mother and two-year-old baby brother, whom he never saw again. So I had just read that to myself out loud, though, walking on that barren land, and then I saw a hole, and I went and I jumped in that hole. And this is what... I found. Oh, it's like the outside the garas of the oh, pottery, it's huh? It's like a red jug that I had just read about. This is you, actually in the film. 
So if when you watch the film, you will you'll see. Find, you'll see. I brought it home with me, and I feel like it's awesome. That's exactly it fits perfectly around your hand. Yeah. So <laughs> she has the handle part essentially, and you can see the red. It's kind of faded out, but that's crazy. I'm almost want don't you shouldn't hold it put in like a nice vase or whatever yeah. or a glass box and Keep protect it, it it's always yeah. with me it's no it's 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 awesome and you can imagine like this is exactly what they were holding 100 and the fact that like you had a feeling to like i'm gonna jump in that hole i'm gonna go I'm look in see there what I could find. something <laughs> pull, something pulled her to it right and yeah and so there's this and there's so much more and each of us has these stories if you go and if you go, and if all of you go, you will find a, a, a piece of yourself. Mm -hmm. You will find a big part of yourself. And, and life will have even a different meaning as, as an Armenian, as a human being, as why we're here. I'm not being like... No, it's extra. one of those journeys, though. Yeah. It's, it is. Yeah. Very eye-opening. It is. So um, you had mentioned that you traveled for the first time with your father. Um, did you, did anybody try talking you out of it? You know, it's did anybody think like, oh, my God, why are you going there? It's probably so dangerous. A lot of people say that. Thankfully, I have um, a, a, a family who's very supportive. I, I had two say, young sounds, children. Sounds like my, my husband, Armenio, is a Venezuelan Armenian. And uh, at that time, Sophie and Daron were something like eight and ten years old. But they've always they they know this is in me. He knows. Everyone knows, and and support it. Well, what do and, you say, what do you uh, say to those people that like will say stuff like that? The, the ones who say even now, like uh, I remember last year I was in Canada and I was showing the film, and and people were were really moved and said, "Wow, I never thought of it this way." and it makes me want to go. It, it makes it, it really does awaken something in people because the, the film itself is very real. It's 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 as if you, Hike, and you, Talia, are on the ground with me because we just go and we get what we can and keep going because I'm not supposed to be shooting this story. I'm not supposed <laughs> to be telling this story. I was going to say, did you come to, like, were there any problems there were filming some. on site? Yeah, I was pretty forward and but i was lucky that um that like experienced people that nothing you. happened but but when people say that um i'm not gonna people have different some people will say i can't i don't want to go to where all that bad stuff happened i don't want to go support that some people say i don't want to give money to turkey i'm not going to pay money to stay in their hotels and eat their food and well, I personally will not go on vacation there. I mean, I don't. Yeah. I don't like it when I hear people are going to vacation there. So at a resort, the, at the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. I, I say the same thing. We say in very basic places. For me, bread and water, water will suffice. It's not the food. <laughs> it's it's the, the it's the food of the soul. It's the food of our people. It's the food of our of our substance or our essence of who we are that, that that place gives us. And if we don't go, then, then we lose out. Then who are we to ever say it's ours yes. or we want it? What, what do you want? You don't even want to go <laughs> see it. You don't even know what exists. And this fellow Steve, whom I met the second time I was there. Yeah. And a Scotsman. I want um, to ask about him. Yeah. This, I was there in, in Gesaria in an old Armenian home, and I saw this guy who's not Armenian, definitely not Armenian, taking pictures in this home. And I'm saying, who are you? And turns out he's this Scottish explorer, a, a loner of a person. He doesn't like talking to people. He, his affairs are with the relics. Yeah. And he discovered our lost world 30 years earlier as an architecture student who was doing some college project in the summer. And he, he stumbled upon Ani the ruins of Ani and Chutzkonk and Gars. And he said, what is this? Yeah. And there wasn't the internet to Google anything, and you know? he spent the next 30 years going by himself and documenting everything. Oh. That's, he's been to Ani 150 times. But uh, he says to me, Armenians talk about wanting it back and, 
and this is ours. And he says, who comes, who of you comes and takes stock of what you have? Who comes and touches it? Who comes and looks at what remains and where it is and what state it's in and has a thinks enough of to have make a plan of what to do with it? Yeah. It's easy to say, give it back. But no. the first step is... Go and see it. I'll go and touch it, right? Claim it as part of your own being. Well, so what are the fears? The fears are, for most people, let's say, oh, it's Turkey, it's dangerous, we're Armenian, they don't want us here, something bad could happen. Uh, two, it's what you said, like there's a traumatic historical part there, like I don't want to go back to the pain maybe. Um, but I love what you said about, I loved everything you just said, and I liked even the the full metaphor you did about how this it's fu- it's food for the soul, you know, and then for a lot of us, maybe we'll continue to feel lost or empty Without this sustenance of going back to Western Armenia, eventually, you know, you're always going to feel empty if you don't you'll yeah. feel whole by going back. I feel well, like learning about it, just like you had mentioned before, we've just kind of like in our minds have placed it as something that doesn't maybe really exist, but it's there. It's there. And you found like so much over there. Uh, or else what happens is that it, it, it then doesn't remain a part of your life. Yeah, your so reality for for people, mm-hmm. for people, it's just the as more time goes on, the easier it is for us to just get caught up with our instant gratification, Instagram mm-hmm. and TikTok and cars and things happening here and parties and 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 other sub- substantial things too, but things that are in our immediate midst and and by doing that though we lose so much of who we are. And for me, it's exhilarating to discover connections. And in historic, in Western Armenia and everywhere, mm-hmm. everywhere I go, here, I want to know where people come from, what their stories are. We have to engage. We can't just, and I'm not lecturing anybody <laughs> like at all, but we have to find a way to... Um, to to keep it alive, to mm-hmm. keep it going. And for me, storytelling and bringing those voices and those visuals together um, is powerful. Yeah, I think it has an effect. I think the visual effect has a big thing as well. Yeah. Um, I definitely want to travel there now. Um, did you have any difficulties traveling or is it any easier for Armenians or more difficult to travel now like, like over the years than maybe. it was then well i think when um i think for many many years armenians just did not travel they really they really they couldn't i mean i think the first 50 years after the genocide armenians were just trying to resettle to get back up on their feet and exist yeah and live survive mm-hmm. survive wherever their new home was and become a part of that home. And I think after 50 years, we found ourselves a little bit and that it started percolating Mm -hmm. and, and then came 75 and then came a hundred. And I think that over time, um, we weren't allowed to go back. We wouldn't even think of going back. And even when Steve started going 30, 40 years ago, it was harder than it is now. Right now, though, it's dangerous. I mean, right now there are bad things happening everywhere. And even when I went, bad things could have happened. I mean, I was told by people, are you crazy? Like I would, (laughs) I would tell people I'm Armenian. I, I kind of have this, uh, I don't know what it is, but I think in, I'm there and I'm thinking my grandparents went through what they went through and our people went through what they went through and gave us life anew. And I'm not going to be afraid. I I didn't even think it. It just was kind of how it was. It's probably not the smartest way to be because you could get (laughs) in a lot of trouble. And I did. What's the worst that could? I don't know. Well, bad things <laughs> could Expre- happen. What is it? Midnight Express, the movie. Uh, I mean, no, no people I'm are kidding. put. People are put in prison. I mean, there, it's happening now. I I went to Istanbul to see where my family is from because my mom's side is Bolsahai. Uh, the Khaypersi side one parts from there, 
But my mom and my grandma would talk me out of it. I had to go secretly. I, only when I was there, I was like, guess where I am? Now you can't, wow. you know, I'm already here. But their whole thing was, was like, hi, get the airport. They're going to arrest you immediately or something like that, which I'm like, it can't be. It can't be that crazy of a thing. I mean, they might see my AYF posts, but I didn't have any issues like that. I didn't. And Istanbul's different, you know. Uh, I'm not coming across like Turkish police here and there or like, what are you doing over there? It was, and I had Armenian friends in the area. But um, I don't know. I feel like it's gotten maybe a little easier to do. I think, and and I also think that there are more people now who who want to live in the truth, yeah, and even risk their own safety, like Turks and Kurds. Turks and Kurds. Yeah, yeah. Not everyone, obviously. I mean, some people I'd look in their eyes and I'd say, "You, yeah, your grandfather killed murder." Yeah. yeah. So. I, I would see that in people and have that rage and sadness inside me. But much more than that, I felt humanity. Mm-hmm. And um, I, well, I felt a lot of things, but I was really taken by how many people I met who are Turks, Kurds, Armenians, hidden Armenians, people who have some sort of Armenian connection or don't, but who have to get it off their chest. Have to say something. They have to, they can't live with themselves anymore. And Armenians who are struggling, especially in Mush and in Dikranagerd, I came across a lot of Armenians who are just hungry to claim their identity. For connection with the rest of the race too, right? With with the themselves, to, to know who they are. Right. And with us, to know that we matter to them. So for me, one of the biggest gifts of being there, and one of the things that I think about all the time, is the people who remain there. And I think they're our living link. I think that um, it's not dead. And I think that it's dead if if we just let it go. And nobody tells if their stories. Nobody no tells their stories. No one connects to no them. No one connects. No one cares enough to actually go and shake yeah. their hand and say hello either. I mean, I found out recently that, you know, in, Mal- in places like Malatya and Yozgat, there are Armenians there right now, like an actual community. They might even go to church. Um, it, not just hidden Armenians. You know, we I, I've seen over the last few years, Dikranagir, the Diyarbakir, they've started to kind of, they just recently opened their church again, actually, Surp Kiragos. Uh, so there are actually Armenians in Western Armenia slowly coming out of the word works. And we know that there's also thousands and thousands of other ones that are a quarter Armenian, half Armenian, don't know it or do know it. So, I mean, there are actual Armenians there. I think the, the tough part for us, let's say like as young AYF members is like, how do we help them when sometimes we think we'll put them in more jeopardy by bringing that attention to them, you know? Um, but they exist. And, you know, if anything, our efforts for Western Armenia should also be like, how do we, uh, how do we, I don't know, either bring them into our world or at least support them in their world, you know? I feel like the film is a great start. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's definitely very eye-opening, for sure. Have you seen it? I have not. So the film ends in, in Dikranagerd at Surp Giragos. There you go. So, and when I was there, and yes, Malatya does have Armenians. I actually went to an Armenian cemetery in Malatya that's that's kept by, like the caretaker is a cousin of Gado Pailan. And Gado Pailan's family is, is buried Malata there. Yeah, and they're they're the grandparents are buried there. So the thing is also, also thing, um Haran think is Malatya too. I'm Ayo. pretty sure, yeah. Ayo. Ayo. Um and then uh in Arabkir there's an Armenian cemetery and there's a, a fellow who there are these there are these Armenian traces and links everywhere. There's this guy in Arabkir who sends me uh, videos sometimes of of a man by a stream. We went to this stream where there was a shirtless man who was playing Armenian music, but I don't know if he's a Kurd. I don't know. I don't know what he is, but it's <laughs> Armenian music and it's freezing and he's like in shorts and, and people are sitting there playing Tavlu and, and it's like this again, it's like this fantasy scene, but it's real. And he's playing the clarinet and, and I still get these videos of this man doing <laughs> that. And I was dancing Hagagan Shurchbad because 
you know, it's you feel like it's yours. There are signs of Armenians, traces of Armenians in the music, in the food, in the soil, in the buildings, in the voices, in the stories. We're everywhere. So it felt familiar. Uh, so familiar. Interesting. So familiar that if you ask me, where do you want to visit in this world? And I love beaches. Like, I love beaches. <laughs> and I love culture. And I love visiting and traveling the world. But if I could spend time, more time somewhere, it would be on those lands. Did, did you guys ever feel, Talia, you've been to Armenia, right? Mm-hmm. When you like, when you, I'm always so happy when I'm in Armenia and like when you touch the ground, like you get that feeling, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone's had that feeling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I always, I I was kind of like half joking about it recently or like when I was in Armenia last time. But the reason why we don't feel good in America or in other places is because this is not our land. It's haunted. You know, there's, there's bad spirits here that are not ours. (laughs) But when we're back in our homeland, like that's the right place where we're supposed to be. There's nothing haunting us, you know? Mm -hmm. And so there's a natural euphoria and happiness that just comes from being where you're supposed to be, you know? And I, and I'm sure you've heard people kind of be like, Oh, Eastern Armenia doesn't always feel like what I thought. Armenia would have been like just from being a Western Armenian. So I'm like, th- that is interesting that potentially, you know, you could still go back to Western Armenia and Turkey and, uh, and be like, this is all very familiar, the sounds and the foods and the smells. So. You also have to be open to it. And I don't know if I feel that haunted thing here. I just don't feel, <laughs> I feel haunted. I, I don't feel the, you know, you go to Armenia and everyone's speaking Armenian and you feel safe, even though we're surrounded by enemies <laughs> and, Bad, bad things do and can happen, but on 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 an Armenian level, like as a you and me and you and all of us, you, mm-hmm. you, you, the kids could walk the streets at three o'clock in the morning, and you're not concerned, and yeah. and it it's so familiar and so it's Eastern awesome. Armenian to me everywhere, too. Everywhere, yeah, I'm same. not just I, and and there you almost feel you know you're even safer because now in Western Armenia. Uh, it's not I'm not protected that way and I, it's I'm not surrounded by Armenians and there's a lot of things going on there still a, so yeah um, but I just want to say about Surp Giragos when I was right. there I met a lot of people who uh, in tears are saying to me that I've I we have a lost past and I was alone and now I've found myself. We're together now. So this place, this place gave them safe haven. It gave them a, a, community. a, a community, a place where they could come and explore their identity. And then it was shut down again. And, and it was a Kurdish mayor who uh, helped make that happen. And I talked to him too in the film. And he, he got, went to jail. He got arrested, yeah. yeah he yeah, went I to know. jail. But he said, we have to face the past. He said, we, we, the Kurds, had a part in the genocide. So people want to own up to it because they recognize that the only way to move forward in life really, truly is with truth. Yeah. Is to acknowledge that truth as, as, as a, as a human being and like as an individual, but as also a part of humanity. I always said that about the Armenian genocide. It's not just for Armenians, but it's also for Turkey and their society to heal themselves and for them to also create a more healthy society for themselves. This, uh, denial that they've been living in is why they continue their oppressive kind of uh, their future generations. They oppress Kurds because they oppressed Armenians. You know, like you, uh, it, it continues until they come to terms with their past. So it's not just for us; it's for the Turks as well. Once we went to this place, Hitzkong. I know this is way too long for the podcast. Not but at all. No, it is. I I know it <laughs> is because people don't have that kind of attention span. But I have it right uh, now. <laughs> no, but uh, we're we're into it, and podcasts are. You know, listeners, you tell us, like, you know, you pause it halfway through and you listen to it the next day kind of mm-hmm. thing. So if anything, just like how your uh, father was working on that oral history, I kind of see the podcast also as like an archive as well. So yeah. say it. Yeah. So Chansosk, how do you say it? Chetskong. Chetskong. It's a thousand year old monastery with five churches. It's near the Armenian border. It's outside of Gars. And, uh, and I look at pictures of that from a hundred years ago or more. And I think, again, I, I am just, I am in awe of how we were able to create these, these mag- magnificent masterpieces. But 
So we were, we had to hike Steve Sim, the explorer, whom, by the way, so he doesn't like talking to people. and I'd love to talk to him, but I know he, he doesn't won't. like being <laughs> interviewed. The fact that he allowed me to follow him and the documentary, by the way, was going. I always knew one day I'm going to tell the Armenian story. I grew up. Um, Your dad's Richard Ovenisian, so. I grew, up with, I grew up with the story. story. I went to school. I became a broadcast journalist. I worked a lot in television, nonfiction television. I did Armenian news for 10 years. So I just, storytelling and television were always in me. I knew I was going to tell our story. I just didn't know how I was going to do it. I didn't want it to be a history lesson. I didn't want it to be just a genocide story. I wanted it to be Raw. more than that, that showed who we are and how it continues and and then what. And and it happened because I went, I mean, it happened when I went to Western Armenia and all these discoveries and meeting Stephen and this non-Armenian Scottish guy who is going every year by himself with a camera and a hat and sunscreen and a measuring thing and quietly going, dodging everybody. Imagine, I mean, and he would do, he would use Google map and maps and he would look at these shadows and these mountains and these must be walls that are facing east, west, this, this, he just would figure it out and he would find his way there knowing that this was something Armenian and then he would maybe be the first person in who knows how many years who's been there. And then he would spend hours there taking pictures, 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 and then go back again and again. So anyway, I, I convinced him to go and for me to follow him. And the documentary was going to be about him. Yeah. But it ended up being about the coming together of our two stories. But I can't tell you how many times we clashed because I would be talking to people and I'd say, what happened to the Armenians? And knowing that I know what happened, but I wanted to hear what the villagers or what the people would say. And he would yell at me saying, Ani, we know what happened to the Armenians. <laughs> Don't ask them. I'm going to go take pictures of the cemetery because... We all know what happened. Yeah. <laughs> but it was a very interesting merging of our stories. Well, I think it's really interesting that... And I, I kind of like this about him. I really wish I could talk to this guy. I would even make this episode about him, but I'm sure he wouldn't want that, right? No, um, that he didn't want to centralize himself on an Armenian story in a, a sense. Like he wanted this Armenian story to not just be about him, but like about an Armenian as well. And that, like, I think that says a lot about his character and like what him understanding the full picture of what all this is. It's not just a cool hobby of his to go look yeah. at things. He gets it that this is like a serious terrible saddest thing ever um and uh and it's gotta it can't just be about him it's gotta include you too so the so the film was both your journeys kind of yeah yeah he while we were there he's saying you have to be a part of this too honey i'm saying no 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 no. (laughs) and it wasn't until i came back and a couple years later when i when i did a version of the, the film just with him but not with my story or journey or my inclusion and it that I realized he's right. It's, it's, it's a bigger story. And I think it made the, the film richer and more complete and more true. Yeah. It made it harder to do it. Cause I had, there was no footage of me because I was <laughs> always shooting behind, you know, I, I didn't include myself while I was making it, but then there, it Did came together and narrate over it or something. Yeah, I do narrate there, yeah. and there's, and, and anyway, it came together quite, beautifully and and it feels good it feels it feels like i've done something that uh, speaking very humbly that when i'm gone uh that this will remain and this is it's your contribution and not a contribution but this is this is a story that will live on yeah so that's kind of how i look at a lot like a, a lot of this stuff and as i mean a part of me worries like if the internet's all gone one day like a lot of our storytelling's gonna be archives. <laughs> i know it's yeah. missing but i guess it's good that this is in dvd right in, as in long as they me. they as long as it doesn't become just part of an archive that people continue listening and watching and it doesn't get put on the shelf somewhere keep it alive so we always have it's to like think we're of doing now that's right and and good for you 
I love what you're doing. I have this <laughs> urge to visit Western Armenia now. It's convincing, right? So you convinced us. I how mean, would you suggest we would approach that? Because I know my ancestors, like where my family from, is mostly from Eintab. Mm -hmm. So maybe I would want to probably visit there first. But uh, Eintab like is beautiful. I mean, there is this part of Eintab where it's like you're in this, you go through these white cobblestone streets and buildings and and it's now it's very hip and they've made them into oh. cafes and so forth but you walk in and there there are grapes hanging from the ceilings these used to be armenian homes all of them they were all armenian homes Definitely visiting and now. Yeah. and now they're uh, bed and breakfast and cafe Coffees, and yeah. chunky dead inch and Water. people are eating and playing and and then you go inside and you see an Armenian name in 1878. Or wow. there, there's so many stories it to be stories. told. Yeah. I've heard it's that old part of the city. Old Anteb is where these old, beautiful Armenian homes were beautiful. built. Beautiful. Yeah, I've heard a lot about it. It was also, I think, um, I think it was Naintab where I saw a, a humongous Armenian church. I think it was one of the largest in the area and they turned that into a mosque and then into a prison and then into a mosque again. But mm -hmm. so if you know the stories, mm -hmm. you go looking for them, you'll find them and just document, document everything, make it come back to life, make it in con it's in front of your face. You can't say it wasn't there or it's not there. It's, it's in true. front of your, it's, it's true. It's so real. the voices, the, people, the places, as long as it's there and as long as we can, let's do it. It's not easy to go. I mean, I would not say go alone. Obviously. I would yeah, say... In general, uh, traveling anywhere in the world. No, yeah, <laughs> I know. Especially there. But especially there, you know, with especially the Especially during on. these times. Especially during these times. I mean, I'm hoping soon. But what would be the tips, let's say, if there were some tips, like find a friend who knows Turkish, someone yes. who maybe lives there, maybe go with like a group. With a small group, not a big group. And I know a few people who go or who have gone. Armin Aroyan doesn't go so much anymore. He's, uh, he's a, a advanced in age. But um, f for example, I think Khachig Muradian still goes. I think Ara Sarafian goes from London. Yeah. Um, I And I've also gone, by the way, with just... When I went to shoot the film, it was just four of us, and we rented a car. Wow. And when I went, I went another year with my big brother, Rafi, yeah. from Armenia, yeah. and we drove. And that was just a few people, but there was a, 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 a driver. Mm -hmm. uh, it's often helpful to have, you can now find uh, people in Armenia who are familiar, especially maybe not if you go deep, 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 but they do these tour type things and maybe you could just customize it for yourself. So it's not a tour because I'm not there for a tour. Yeah. But, I've, I've seen those signs and like there's vans in Yerevan where it says like uh, Van, you could go to Van, Ani, and, like a few of those cities. Yeah. You know? I mean, maybe for starters you could do that, but then you have to dig deeper. Yeah. And then also often there are Kurdish drivers, uh, inside of history of western armenia who it just takes research and it, it takes they finding you your there. way yeah and and take you you also have to just be careful because as far as we've come it's still a dangerous place and bad things still happen and yeah. what i was going to tell you about Chitzkonk, by the way when i oh, went yeah. to that place uh we stopped our car and we we uh hiked for hours and then it appeared and it was five churches. Now it's just one church because the Turkish military blew up. I know exactly there. what spot and you're the, talking about. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, but it was very impressive and very emotional. And then, then it's raining and pouring and there's lightning and thunder and we're soaking and we're wet and we're cold. And then it gets dark and we hike our way back and then the car doesn't start. And we're in the middle of nowhere and the car won't start because the lights were left on. Uh, yeah. And then we had to, go and we were we were assisted actually by Turk, like six turkish soldiers yeah. with rifles and so forth but they helped us nice. they they ended up saying you know we're just doing our time mm -hmm. 
yeah. uh, here. It's not, they weren't happy doing what they were ha- they first doing. Time. Yeah. So well, so we were talking about how we like it's important for us to go back and make it part of our reality for all the reasons we spoke about in this episode. But it sounds like one of the things that people can work on is how do we make it more accessible and easier to go and visit Western Armenia? We know that there are professors like Khachig and I feel like even your dad would hold like to take people there and stuff. I think my grandma went with them once, but, um, but maybe we can think of a way to organize a, you know, make it easier. You go to Istanbul, there's Armenian guy there. Armenians from Bolis maybe start a company and they could take people around the country. I know we have them in Armenia, but Anyways, that could be something for the listeners to think about as a project. <laughs> if you want, uh, I, uh, everything <laughs> takes research. Nothing, you know. But there could be demand for it. Just we need the opportunities to go back. And, I, uh, I don't know. And uh, and 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 the interest and um, it's doable. Yeah, it's definitely doable. It just takes some planning and. And I feel like those types of adventure adventures like end up becoming the the most profound and best in any way like when it's a challenge and when it's like you know you kind of get lost here and you have to have a frustrating yeah. moment instead of just you know going to a major city in europe and walking around and seeing the eiffel tower let's say like what you know an adventure through western armenia it sounds like the most memorable thing in many levels yeah, so. yeah. i guess the experience that's it's, the most important part it's an unforgettable experience so it's supposed to be like planned step by step but you kind of just end up where you do yeah you have to have some planning but <laughs> i mean you know what i mean <laughs> yeah. you go with the flow yeah. Yeah. You, you, you will be surprised how much you find and um I very much want to watch the film now. So. Okay. Well, I hope you do. You'll have lots of opportunities to. So the film was showing this last year on April 24 on PBS. Um, where do you think we can watch it again? Well, uh, on um, April 24th, it showed on PBS SoCal, Southern California. And it showed on April 24th because they started showing it in Southern California on PBS SoCal and, and KCET in December. And it did so well for PBS. It was the top performing program of their entire schedule and and top performing for them during pledge drives. You know, PBS is public television. They don't have advertising. They don't have commercials. Yeah. So they depend on viewers to call in and become members. And with $10 a month, you get this. With $15 a month, you get that, depending on what show you watch. But so they, this is this is how they operate, and I don't know. I've grown up watching PBS, and I think they have magnificent programming. And my parents have watched it, and I've watched it. And if I could choose a home for the hidden map, it would be PBS. So when it aired on PBS SoCal and it did really well, they said, you know, there are others who are interested, and then they said. PBS National is interested in your film. And I was like pretty excited. Pretty excited. They said, don't get your hopes up because that's a really big thing and it doesn't happen often. In fact, it's quite rare that an independent film would be picked up by, by PBS National. nationally. Yeah. And nationally, they have 330-some affiliates across the country. And so as it turned out, it's been months of going back and forth and changing things for them and and little things and big things, not the content of, of, of the film, but oh, just to be at the nation at, at their level. And last week I got an email and then a phone call saying that the hidden map is premiering on June fourth nationwide. And it, it starts on June 4th, but I got a list of about a thousand, a thousand broadcasts across the country, mm. most of them starting around June 6th. And yeah, it's, it's so exciting that I'm almost, I almost don't want to say it because I just Why? want it to happen. happen and, already. but I need to, uh, I need to, to yeah. I, I have a lot to do. I want the world to know. I want the United States to know. I want viewers to know. Because it will be covering almost all the country. The, the thing is that viewers, in order to watch it, they have to know when to watch it. So they have to go to their local PBS station and go to the schedule. And on the schedule, there is a, a search 
bar and you put in the hidden map. And uh, sometimes they schedule it two weeks out, sometimes a month out, but uh, it'll show the channel and it'll show, it'll the, show the channel. And a lot of stations don't just have one PBS channel. They have PBS and then they have PBS world and then they have PBS whatever. So it's just be, be patient, be persistent, care enough to look at what time and what day it's going to air. And I also have a very um, basic website, very, very, very basic website, which I need to kind of update. If there are web people out there that I'm not, please let me know because I, <laughs> I would love to have a nice website. But on it, I'm going to put on the front page um, a link to a list of about 900 of the screenings. Where which you can is find a, it, yeah. Where, yeah, so it's, that's, it's not complete, but so either go to PBS, look at the schedule, or go to thehiddenmap.com, and you could find about nine, 850 or 900 listings there. And a bulk of them are June 6th to the 13th. But I'm going to say this. They've told me, PBS has told me, that if people respond, if they pick up the phone and if they feel moved to call and become a donor, a donor to PBS, it all goes to PBS, not to me. But what happens for us is that our story gets told. They will continue to air it. And it's um, shared. And for up to two years. That's crazy. So this is kind of our, this is our um, starting point, And hopefully there is more after that. All right, everybody, you know what you got to do. This is your contribution to the, spreading the word about Western Armenia. Uh, I mean, so you can watch it on PBS, but I, we did, like I, I was noted, I, I saw that, you know, you showed it to the community of Sweden, right? Or, yes. or you like we're at UK and talking to the parliament members yeah, there. That's was, awesome. Amazing. Great. By the way, that's exactly where this film should be showing is like all the policymakers in the world. But like, for example, let's say someone wanted to reach out and say, Hey, I want to, my organization wants to do a showing, like can they do something like that potentially? Yes, they can. Even though I've given PBS the the right to air this for two years and they said it's an exclusive right. And I said, okay. well, I still want to be able to use it for education and I want to be able to speak with groups because that face-to-face -face interaction and conversation is invaluable. So I have the right to do that. Nice. I don't want it to take the place of people watching it on TV because that's a different experience it is, too. It is. Yeah. So we'll ask after June. Okay. Everyone ask in July. But um, and but I no, just that's good to know though. And I just want to say that if people do pledge to PBS when they watch the Hidden Map, so again, none of this has to do with me monetarily. For me, the 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 win, the gain is having our story on a national platform where millions of viewers across the United States will learn our continuing story. Mm -hmm. That's my gain. That's our gain. It is. So this is our opportunity to come together, really to come together and mobilize and in a in a not a difficult way, in a, in a very exciting way. Watch a film and uh and, your family and, relax and watch and it. If you pledge uh ten dollars a month, I'm just giving you the basics. Yeah. Uh, to PBS in your area. I think they will have a phone number wherever you live. You'll get the Hidden Map DVD. And if you pledge $15 a month, I wanted to make the gifts really very meaningful and valuable. So I went through thousands of photographs from, um, from our journeys into Western Armenia, and I picked a dozen of them. I'm opening this box of postcards. Oh, there are no five way. by seven postcards. And they're images uh, of monasteries, nice. of um, there's Mount Ararat behind a mulberry tree, inside a church. This is Ani. This is, look at this. This is a hidden chapel in Hokeyatsvank. Uh, this is the donkey in Basmashen. Hey, it's your friend. Your friend. <laughs> uh, these are Khachkars that still remain in, in near Bitlis, where Saroyan was born. The cranes, the guru, the classic. Yeah. I mean, and this is Chutzkonk before yeah, and like, after. And digging by Zadam Baron Sarkis from Dikranagerd, who were the Armenians I met wow. uh, the first time I was there. And they said, Yerpek Chimornak, Mezi Chimornak, Yev Chimornak, Vor Hayek. Yevadi Yerpek Bichimornak. So these postcards and th this doll that's crocheted by hand. In Armenia, us. in Goris, by women. Um, I've heard of them, yeah. Many of these are women who were displaced from Artsakh, lost a husband, lost a son, 
or just displaced all over again. And they're crocheting these beautiful traditional Armenian dolls to represent the strength and beauty and resilience of Armenians. And so they're being helped too. Yeah, you're also supporting them as well. Right, right. So there are so many levels of support that this goes through, but the the, mid, the pictures are amazing. They're beautiful, and if we can, I would like to like maybe on our social media we could share a few like images sure. from your travels and stuff. Sure. Um, but Ani, this was move, very moving, and um, me, Talia and I, I think both very agree we, we we want to go to Western mm-hmm. Armenia ASAP. <laughs> Um, t- and I think times are tough, but honestly, when is it ever not going to be tough? So whenever we get a chance, we got to go. Hoping but yeah, we will. Yeah. So thank you very much, Ani. Miasin. Tebi harach miasin. Ayo, tebi haik. Abrik. You are listening to Haituk Talks, the official podcast of the AYF West. I'm Haik Minasian. I'm Talia Bezjan. And we're just a couple of Armenians talking in the world. A couple of Armenians talking in the world.